recording now, so we're live. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, I'm Mike Overstreet, and uh, I've been doing robotics for uh, a long time. I started out uh, uh, in school doing Lego and Vex, and uh, then went into first, and then when I got out of high school, I jumped into mentoring and then college, and then I went to Rebel Games I think it was 2005, 2006, and San Mateo got heavily involved uh, I, in, in robots and how ro uh, uh, humanoid robots and so on. So uh, I wanted to talk to Daniel here about his really cool IEEE conference that he uh, workshop he did a few weeks ago, like maybe three, four weeks ago. So Daniel, kind of introduce yourself and who you are, what you do, and so we can kind of jump in to talk about your really cool workshop. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, so hi, I'm uh, Dan Lofaro. Um, I am a research scientist at the uh, uh, U.S. Naval Research Laboratory, or NRL, in Washington, D.C. Uh, and I'm specifically a part of the Navy, Navy Center for Applied Research in Artificial Intelligence. Um, and I'm also a professor at George Mason University. Uh, I in the past and still currently, I focus on humanoid robots, uh, specifically adult-sized humanoids. Uh, so ones around the size of a regular human, not the tiny ones, but the taller ones. Um, but I also have now been focusing on emergent behaviors and swarming, so how many agents uh, work with each other as well as work with humans uh, with simple rules to, be to perform some more complex tasks. And this is not just in the air, but also on the ground, underwater, or in other uh, areas as well. Cool. Oh, and just for the record, I'm not everything I say is my opinion, not the opinion of uh, the U.S. government or Navy or the university. Oh, that's cool. No, that's this is it's kind of informal hangout where two people are talking about it, what I call well, I think it's a really cool subject: robots, anything robots. Just kind of brainstorming. Oh, I just say that because otherwise they'll yell at me. Yeah, oh, no, that's fine. No, I, I, no, I totally understand. So, um, uh, when I post this video, I'll post links to you. You actually posted the, the workshop conference on YouTube. Uh, so, I'll, I'll post a link underneath the video when, we, when I post this video. So, and people I'm also, can see it. And I'm also splitting up all of the, uh, those talks into uh, separate videos. So, you can watch them instead of having to go through the whole um, multi hour long thing. Okay, cool. Very cool. Yeah, it's, it's almost, uh, I think, six hours. Which was, which was uh, so, so for those uh, who are not familiar with this workshop, it was uh, titled a Workshop on Future Trust in Robotics, Autonomous Systems, and Artificial Intelligence. This was at the uh, uh, IEEE Robots and Automation Society International Conference on uh, Ubiquitous Robots, or um, UR. It was supposed to be in Kyoto, Japan. Um, yay, love Japan, love working with Japan. But because of COVID, we had to put it online. Um, so this whole six hour uh, thing um, was amusing for me being located on the East Coast of the US because to be respectful of uh, the original venue, we held it at Japan time, um, which is thir plus thir uh, minus 13 hours for me. So, yeah. Okay, so th that kind of leads into my first question. So everybody's experimenting with online conferences because of COVID-19, education, virtual virtual learning, and so on. So I, I fortunately got involved with Zoom last year doing uh, volunteer online classes to kids through a couple different uh, web portals. Mm -hmm. And that introduced me to Zoom. So I kind of knew what Zoom was when everybody started jumping into Zoom. So, but I'm just kind of curious since you the, or, you put this event on, you organized the event. What kind of what kind of lessons do you learn? Maybe well, what kind of cool things do you learn? What kind of pitfalls do you learn? Behind, it's kind of like a behind the scenes uh, of, of, of the event, how you put it on, and kind of give us an overview of that. Sure. Well, it's a so sure. I, I was the chair, but it wasn't just me who put it on. Uh, I was I was working with uh, Ben Knott from ONR Global in Tokyo, uh, Dramat Chen from uh, AORD, also in Tokyo, and uh, Laura Steckman uh, from AFOSR. Uh, so together we uh, were able to put this whole thing together. Um, but you know, it's kind of, you know, we didn't want to cancel the workshop uh, because 
that conference only picks two workshops uh, for the conference, and we were one of them. So we were like, all right, we can't cancel this. Uh, so what can we do? Now, you know, we, we had a very, very good um, uh, list of speakers, um, include, including um, uh, Ishiguro Sensei, uh, Mark Tilden, David Hansen. I mean, big names, and among others. But, you know, what happens with important people, what they're sometimes late with doing things, um, as we all are, uh, as one of my favorite um, sayings is, thank God for the last minute, otherwise nothing would ever get done. Right. Um, so, you know, being also a professor, I know to schedule everything well ahead of time. So to get this going, instead of having live talks, I had all of them uh, pre-record uh, their talk. And it wasn't just that their talk and their audio is on the screen. I also made sure that they had their face in the bottom right hand corner so that as they talk, people can connect with their lips. Um, now, this is extra important since we're, this is in an international community. Um, because when you speak the same language, you don't really need visual cues as much if that's your natural language. However, without your natural language, you uh, typically pick up on more visual cues. At least that's one of the you know, parts of the research that I've been looking into. And I'll explain so, uh, another area of research I'm going into based on that in a little bit. But because of that, we put the uh, visual um, of them speaking in the bottom right hand corner, which ended up very nice, uh, working out very nicely. And we had this due about two weeks before the um, actual uh, conference because sure enough, the we got the videos, one of which within a few hours of the actual workshop. But then they stayed, uh, some of them were live um, during their presentation after to answer questions, which was okay. nice. So uh, a key thing there was that mm -hmm. everything was being run out of, um, out of my house with one of my PhD students as uh, the backup. So if my internet went down, then they would do theirs. So instead of having to switch off from one computer to the other, we had one point of a failure with a backup. Um, that just made things move a lot smoother, um, it, it, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, so doing everything ahead of time, uh, recording ahead of time, and um, you know having uh, that backup in one point of failure, I think was the main things. That, okay, that's pretty cool. I didn't I did realize that when watching the, the conference on YouTube that you pre-recorded. Well, I, I saw, I know you pre-recorded some stuff, which is obvious, but I didn't know everything was pre-recorded. That, but that's actually a cool idea. And then you had them come on live later uh, and, and uh, at, uh, answer questions. So, um, is there any, so is there anything, it, I know in this COVID-19 world now, this post, well, post-COVID-19 world, the online conferences are going to become probably more and more uh, uh, is the way of doing business. I mean, do you feel that same way? Or is it a combination of both live and uh, online stuff? Or I hope not. I hope it does not go towards online conferences because, um, so this conference, uh, the registration fees were still the normal registration fees slightly reduced. Um, but not nearly enough for my opinion. Now, it, sorry, I triple E, but um, I think what they charge for this type of thing is too much, um, especially since people like me and other professors and researchers were the ones that review all the papers for no cost, were the ones that put on the conference for no cost and this workshop for no cost. And what we get out of it is a chance to go meet somewhere and meet new people. So the benefit to us that, you know, sure, it does cost us $1,000 uh, in registration fees to go to a conference in, for the high-end robotics ones, but we get to make more connections, which is worth the money, oh, okay. kind of. But in a virtual setting, it's not, because you don't have that interaction nearly as much. Be sure you get to see the talks, which is good, but you don't get to go to the bar or the uh, coffee okay. house, you know, with someone and then make that connection. Uh, 
like at a uh, uh, at an Ikra, I met um, my personal academic idol, Osama Khatib. And yay, I would not have been able to do that if it was over um, Zoom. Right. But I met him in person in Portugal, and it was wonderful. He even got me a drink. I was very happy. Um, but that's the type of thing that conferences, I think, are really for, is that networking. Sure, we can share the, the material, but everyone posts their stuff online. Uh, everyone, ha uh, We can share our scientific stuff then anyway, but there's very little room for us to do these discussions. Sure, right. they have breakout rooms available in this, but it's too much effort to really, at the moment, it's too much effort to have that really work. Um, but on the plus side, since everything's recorded, everything's recorded and gets to go up online so you can rewatch it as needed, which is nice. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. I mean, because I, I will agree with you, in-person uh, conversations after the event or during the event, it's like with RoboGames, when I went to RoboGames back in 2005, 2006, I, my, I, people I knew was just local to my area, to where in my hometown, Kansas City. So once I started going to RoboGames, I was meeting people from all over the world that have lots of really cool contacts with people that I would never have had had I not been at a, uh, a, a you know, a, you know, at a robot competition with lots of people and you're just talking and just sharing information and afterwards, you know, dinner or uh, uh, some drinks or whatever at the bar. Yeah, I, I can see, yeah, I, that's definitely a, uh, one of the draw, uh, one of the drawbacks of a virtual online conference. Yeah, I agree with that. The nice thing about the, these virtual meetings is that, you know, once you have these acquaintances, it's really easy to do a, a more intimate, um, you know, video conversation with just two people or a group of people, which is good. Um, but that requires that you already have those connections. Right. So, yeah. That's, so it's a great it. thing if, for the people who already exist. Um, so you can think of the, this workshop more of like a TV show, right? Uh, we put it on, it was scripted. We get a little bit of input from the audience, but it's much, much more limited than it would have been if it was the in-person. Yeah. See, that's one of the things, uh, before, before COVID-19, what, I mean, there's all you need to try to look for a silver lining and, you know, or looking for something good out of something bad. I mean, that's one of the things that before I really didn't use uh, virtual meetings or conferences to talk to people. I would email them, call them on the phone and talk to them. But I definitely like this, the ability to see the person, see their reactions, uh, it's 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 definitely a lot better, I think, than email and phone. So I, I definitely like how we're all doing these virtual online conferences and uh, communications now. I, I definitely like that. That's one of the cool things that's become. Yeah, and the great like. thing is, um, so I'm somewhere around 35-ish in that vicinity. I don't remember, um, but I. I've, I've, I've been using video conferencing for a very long time. And with my younger friends, that's what we use. With my older colleagues, they were not used to doing that. So it was always the telephone. But because of the COVID situation, it has forced them to start using the video stuff. And it's no longer difficult, right? It's just, all right, that's what we do. Turn it on. So now since we're all set up, it's no longer a hassle you just send them the link like, all right, which one is it? Is it yeah. Zoom? Is it WebEx? Uh, you know, is it Teams? Oh, okay, fine, click. It's yeah. open. Like, you know, right now you're on two beautiful speakers right here. I have three cameras in front of me. Depends on what view I want. Um, it's just. Yeah, I, I definitely, I'm getting better at uh, these online coverage in Zoom. I need to get multiple cameras like you have. I finally got a, a really nice camera uh, that does low lighting. Because I noticed a lot of people, if their lighting is kind of low, the, the, their their camera can be kind of fuzzy and out of focus a little bit. So yeah, yeah. Uh, so cool. So I think we kind of beat it, kind of beat that question really well. So let's kind of <laughs> jump into the jump into the co uh, conference and some of the topics. So my two takeaways. It, you may 
differ from this, but my two takeaways was, uh, do people trust robots? And how can we develop the trust between people and the robots? Because in more and more, we're gonna see robots in the world, as far as in businesses, in homes, even schools is a great example. We're probably gonna see more robots in schools to help with teachers and so on, telepresence robots. Uh, and then the other really interesting conversation you had, uh, many, there was many questions on this, is what happens when the uh, robots fail? Who's responsible uh, and so on. So can you kind of like talk about, I mean, maybe your, your takeaways and uh, what, uh, you know, the topics maybe you were, you found interesting, but those are the two ones I, I, I found the most fascinating. So, so we actually kind of designed the conference around the, or the workshop rather, around uh, the few major, um, you know, keys of trust, which involves um, the physical action. So how does, you know, one action, uh, how does it, something's action uh, change your perception of it? Um, then we did looks, like, so visual aspect. So I don't know if you're aware of this, but in the first about three seconds, someone has made 90% of the opinion that they will have of you, period. And it's going to be very difficult for that to, for that to change. That's the initial impression. That's why we always wear a nice pair of shoes because that really says a lot about you, whether, and that's all subconscious to the other person. Um, and so how does that map to the robot? Um, that's specifically why um, we had David Hansen and Ishiguro Sensei on there, right? Because, you know, they are, you know, pushing the envelope of the realistic side of robots. But and then we have Mark Tilden there, is he has another view of it, right? Where it, it's not necessarily has to be human-like, but the human action. So you anthropomorphize some of the physical actions along with this perception of safety, right? Um, and so that is uh, with the trust aspect, it's, is it gonna hurt you? Do you can you trust it's not gonna hurt you? Right. All right, so that was another one of the big things we wanted to uh, look at there. Where finally it was the, uh, the laws um, that'll govern autonomous systems, right? So we have laws right now that uh, govern a vehicle in the United States, typically it's whoever's front of the car hits something, it's typically their fault because they had the forward momentum and they had control to change the situation. Sure, there's exceptions, but that is the major rule. Um, and you have to go through many, many steps to say, hey, these brakes failed because the manufacturer screwed up in order for it to not be the driver's fault. Right. Um, we're at, but the human has, because it's shown time and time again that the human has the majority of control of that vehicle. So that's different with an autonomous vehicle, right? Which human is in control of the vehicle? And then how do you punish those humans in a proper way? So, and that's why Joshua Kroll was, uh, you know, kind of talking about that aspect. And if you did not watch his, um, his was hilarious and very to the point. Uh, so he's a new professor at um, Navy Postgraduate School. Um, and it's a very good uh, presentation. So I'll plug that one a little bit more. Uh, but we did design it that way to look at the, uh, the looks, the actions, uh, as well as um, the laws behind it. So kind of, can you kind of summarize who do you think, this was an interesting discussion you had with him. Can you kind of summarize who you think is responsible? So if a robot in the workplace goes nuts or does something unpredictable, who, in your opinion, who's responsible? I mean, this is your opinion and your opinion, but who, who do you think is responsible for that robot? Yeah, so again, this is my opinion, not uh, NRLs or uh, my universities. If an autonomous system in autonomous mode hits something, and I mean any sort of autonomous mode where the human is not in full direct control, like you would have with a regular vehicle, it is the CEO and the owners of the company's fault. So if that kills someone, the CEO, that, that you heard me right, should be the one to go to jail for third degree murder. Oh, okay. 
Oh, it, it, it makes sense, right? Because right. If, if the driver hits someone accidentally, right, there's a possibility that they can go to jail for third degree murder. If the autonomous system goes, uh, you know, hits someone, there should be no less punishment than that. And sure, that might sound absurd, but that just means you have to set the, uh, the safety factor of these agents that are out in the world to such a high standard that someone's going to be able to put their life, you know, on the line for that. Now, there's another option. Uh, because in America, um, you know, there's been many court cases that have shown that uh, uh, companies are people. They're considered people. They have rights um, so that they can back political um, uh, people and, you know, give money. So that also means that they should be able to go to jail. So maybe it's not the CEO, but let's say a Tesla vehicle again hits someone and kills someone. And now they have to go to jail for life which means that the company can't make, can't do any work, can't make any money. If they're considered people in one end aspect of the law, the company should be considered a person in another aspect. So it's, it's just another way of looking at it. And there has to be a reasonable way of uh, figuring this out, uh, who is actually responsible than what we've been doing, which there, I don't think there's been enough uh, done yet. That's kind of so kind of you're using the I'll use the Star Trek analogy. So Captain Kirk would always say, I'm responsible for the actions of everybody on the ship. So if you're gonna punish somebody, you will punish me because I'm ultimately responsible for everything that happens. Uh, but the interesting thing is so if I'm a if I'm a lawyer, which I'm not, maybe I would, I would think that maybe I would take the approach to was what I would try to find somebody, I would find the, the person who wrote and tested the code that, that was the issue. Um, or I, I mean, I've heard this debate, but I, I definitely you feel that that's not the person responsible. Okay, sure, you could say that, but, you know, Captain Kirk or Jean-Luc Picard, who is my favorite, sorry, I'm a TNG guy. Right. Then, well, actually, it's Deep Space Nine, uh, then Voyager. After yeah. you, you have to watch Voyager in a row. You can't watch pieces of it. Then TNG. Then it would be original. And then I'm going to say it. I love Enterprise. They're all good, but Enterprise is good. It is last, but it's good. Um, anyway, um, do we, uh, have, blame it on someone who you know, did that, wrote that code fine, but they're not the one that put it out to market. They have zero say whether it goes out to market. Um, so no, they're not at fault. They made you something to the specifications, right? And then someone else has to check it. And it's the final say of that CEO, maybe even the shareholders that, um, uh, you know, that gets to say, hey, this goes out because it's going to benefit them. Right. Right. Well, yeah. That that makes sense because I mean Boeing, Boeing is a great example because uh, there's a lot of talk about who who wrote the code that caused the 737 Max to, to fail and have this yep. issue, but ultimately the 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 person being held responsible, the the ent entity that's being held responsible is Boeing, and they're suffering the consequences for uh, the CEO and the shareholders. Yep. Okay, okay, but, but on that aspect, who, what consequences are they? They're losing money. Right. How many people died because of this decision? And how many, how many lifetimes in jail is that CEO who made this decision going to be in jail? Zero would be my guess. And this is a, that's a blatant decision to do something that is unsafe, that the, science, that the engineer said, no, don't do this, and they still did it. So, yeah, that that's a little bit uh oh yeah the uh, 787 issue that's that, that's a not not 787 sorry uh, 737 max that issue is a that's a toughie. Yeah, I mean it's a, that's why I, that's why I brought it up. I think it's an interesting conversation about uh, uh, one of the, to uh, the topics you brought up is is like I said as robots become more and more in the world around us. There's all going to be kind of a lot of ramifications for that, and one of them is what happens when they fail. Um, so yeah, I, 
it's not nothing we can both decide right now today. No. Something's to be talked about for years. So, but it's a very interesting topic. At least yeah, just topic. overall, until robots get their own vote, so once they can vote for president or prime minister or whatever, they have the same human rights that we do. Um, until that day happens, then a regular human has to be fully responsible for what they do. And it has to be done in a reasonable way. If an autonomous agent kills someone, uh, makes money, oh, then the person who made it gets that money. If the autonomous system does something bad, then the same consequences that a regular person would have had go against them has to go against the, in this case, the owner of the company. Um, and that's the only way things are going to be really safe. Because one thing that bothers me, living in the district area, um, is they're allowed to drive these autonomous vehicles uh, in the area. They, they're allowed to be in autonomous mode here. I don't want to be a test subject. These things are not proven. There's no um, test, there's no federal guidelines and um, uh, test drive that these autonomous systems have, have to do. So they're treating me as a, a guinea pig. And where is, um, oh, what's it, the, uh, where's, where's the IRB that I had to sign? Oh, okay. Right? Yeah. I, I'm on the road with them. It's a, literally a test situation. They're gathering data on the public and I didn't have to sign an IRB. Right. You know, doing human robot testing, we're always doing IRBs. So where's the IRB? That's, that's, yeah, that's a very good point. So how do you feel, because I've talked to a lot of people about telepresence robots and robots doing basic autonomous activities like uh, cleaning, uh, you know, cleaning the floors, cleaning uh, bathrooms, uh, like my little pal over here being just, just like social, you know, like C-3PO walking around trying to help people out, answer questions, so on. So. Do you, are, you, are you nervous or not? maybe not nervous is the question, but when we start getting robots in a business environment, walking around, uh, are, you, are you comfortable with that now? Or do you think we need to have more rules and guidelines and uh, uh, ways to, to, to guide how robots interact with people in the workplace or the school or the home? So, um, so first, robots in general, the first job that they're gonna take over in mass, and I'm talking about physical robots, not um, artificial intelligence of any sort, or to um, uh, to quote Neil Stevenson, uh, pseudo intelligence PI, because right now it's they're basically just following rules as opposed to having their own being. That would be having their own being would be an artificial intelligence. This is a pseudo intelligence. Um, uh, anyway, the um, the major jobs I think these agents are going these robots are going to have, whether they're teleoperated or autonomous, is going to cover the uh, three Ds. The dull jobs, so the ones that are boring and re repetitive, um, you know, like sewing, manufacturing. Um, the dirty jobs, like sewer cleaning, right? right? You know, or going out to, you know, clean up poop somewhere. Um, you know, or the vacuuming, or the dangerous jobs. Um, so the places where humans can't or shouldn't go, uh, you know, like in uh, nuclear reactors, like in um, uh, the Fukushima um, uh, power plant, where they would go check on uh, that to attempt to close the valve and uh, see how things are going. You don't want to send in a human, you want to send in a robot. So the dull, dirty, and dangerous jobs. As long as they start there, we're fine. And automation throughout the years has, you know, been filling those roles specifically. Uh, you saw that most with, um, uh, with factory workers, right? Uh, in fact, in the uh, late um, 1800s, there was a uh, device that was attempted to be illegalized in America because big business um, did not like the uh, ramifications of their factories being closed because one person could then do the job of 10. So they would end up going out of business because they had all these people and they said, oh, we're going to lose all these jobs. What are these people going to do for work? Do you know what that uh, invention was? 
Oh, that 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 item was. Uh, I mean, I have some idea. I mean, are you basically you're talking uh, in factory automation and factory. Uh, it is sure it could be kind of factory automation. It's the sewing machine. Oh, I see where you're going. They, okay. They tried to. Yeah. Um, companies actually tried to illegalize the sewing machine because the excuse was people are going to lose jobs. Sure, seamstresses lost their jobs, but what was the what was the ramifications? Um, well, textiles um, cost went down significantly. So instead of having two outfits, your everyday outfit and your Sunday outfit, now you have 30, right? That right. price dropped significantly. Plus, it added more time for that repetitive job. Since you don't have to do that repetitive job anymore, you can now do something uh, more interesting that you might like more. And sure, you could still do that job if you wanted to. Um, but that's not most people's desire. So robots yeah, are taking going, over jobs like that. You're going from the cottage industry where you have lots of people sewing uh, 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 by hand garments to factories that you have sewing machines, or like you said, one person could produce clothing a lot faster with a sewing machine when it would take five, ten people to do, to do without a sewing machine. Okay, I see what you're saying. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that makes sense. So, um, so a more recent example um, is going to be, and you're seeing this because of COVID. Uh, at least on the East Coast, we have this thing called Easy Pass. So it is a radio frequency based um, uh, tag that goes on your car, and then you go through the toll booth really fast. So the state or Commonwealth gets your ticket, uh, uh, gets your money, and you don't have to slow down. Now, because of a lot of union rules and other rules. Um, they kept the employees for cash toll takers. Because of COVID and taking cash, um, they've turned into using uh, OCR on license plates and giving you uh, the, if you didn't have easy pass, uh, you're given the um, fee via mail. My guess is these people are not gonna come back and they're going to, in fact, a lot, so a few states have already announced this, that they're going to keep it uh, humanless. Right. So it, it is, it is bad that, you know, these people lose their jobs now. Um, and it also gives the government a, an ability to increase rates more. But the upside is it'll reduce traffic because now you don't have that area where everything slows down. So in this, that transition period, it's a little bad, but overall, it, uh, it'll, it'll be a net gain. And that's minus the privacy concerns, which is a whole nother issue. Uh, we can talk about that later, but. That's cool. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, so let's, let's kind of maybe have some thoughts on this. So I've talked to a few people about, I think you, you mentioned this a little bit, is when a person first meets a robot or sees a robot, in, uh, in the hospital, school, business, home, you, whatever example you want to use, uh, the the outside appearance. How do you did you get any takeaways about how you improve that trust when a person first meets a robot? Was there any takeaways from the uh, uh, comp workshop that you stand stood out to you about that topic? Uh, specifically about that workshop, um, or anything in general? If you have like a thought in general about. So one thing that amused me, and this is with a lot of Ishiguro Sensei's work. Um, uh, so he's Japanese and a lot of his work is in Japan. So when he makes a robot, um, one of his Geminoids, they're standing nice and still and they're talking, um, which, you know, I, I'm an American um, and by my last name, you can tell I have a little Italian in me. And you might also see I'm moving my hands a lot. I hate to stereotype, but you know, we talk with our hands, right? Um, but you know, in Japan, usually you'll it's polite to be more still and calm when you talk. So it might so that robot might look more robotic because they're not moving because of the lack of body language. But in reality, because of the culture it's in, has more body language. Uh, sorry, has, has, it looks more like an actual uh, you know, person because it's being ultra respectful. Um, 
So that, that was an amusing takeaway I got from it, though it wasn't said. It's just the the way in which uh, you know it was implemented. So uh, yeah, that, that that's a, that's a very interesting point because I, I've seen a lot of examples. I can't remember them off the top of my head, but there's a few companies in Japan developing robots uh, uh, as kind of like cooks, servers, waitresses, butlers. And uh, the, the original design was a very kind of generic, uh, commonplace design, you know, smooth, round faces, kind of visually appealing like snow over here. But they found in the Japanese, uh, uh, welcome to in the Japanese Hello, market that uh, that's just nice to talk in the Japanese market that didn't go off as well. So now they've got this kind of darkish color, almost black color with these long appendages on it. And they think that's more appealing to the Japanese people uh, than, uh, well, at least to me, it's not as appealing as it's to me as a more smooth rounded shape like this. But yeah, that's interesting how cultural, cultural uh, 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 changes in social service robots, we have to account for that. That's, 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 that's a very good takeaway. Because um, definitely, because I, I observed that uh, that we do like uh, we do kind of uh, I call it like pets like dogs and cats. We like the kind of round like in America we kind of like the round faces, the big the big eyes, the big pupils, the the, the kind of kind of expressions, the kind of the dog cat kind of look, kind of appeals to us. Yeah, that's, so yeah, that's that's interesting. I've also as you as you mentioned. It's a good point about movement, because for me, when I, I see a lot of uh, the robots uh, made in Japan, China, and South Korea, uh, I can, I can, they, they stand out to me. I, I see them as robots because, like you said, they don't have lots of hand gestures, lots of facial expressions. So I, I definitely, I definitely notice that, because like you, <clears throat> with his humanoid robots. I can definitely tell the difference because if you have a video, not a picture, it's hard to tell the difference sometimes. But when he does a video, you can kind of tell because there's almost zero movement with a lot of the with a lot of robots he's developed in when they talk uh, facially and hand gestures. So, so it's funny you said they look uh, very lifelike in pictures. Um, so at ICRA 2018 in Madrid, um, Ishiguro Sensei brought uh, Erica, uh, which is one of his Geminoids, to uh, be at the conference. And me being me, I took a selfie with her, right? You know, sat next to her, was all cute. And we took a selfie and I posted it online. And people were like, oh, Dan, you got a new girlfriend? <laughs> they had no clue it was a robot. <laughs> like, now that's a robot. <laughs> I thought it was very funny. Right, but that, that's a kind of interesting, kind of in, we're kind of off made golf and a tangent. But those videos of not Boston Dynamics, but Boss Boston Dynamics, they did those funny, hilarious videos. Oh yeah, the, CGI. I can kind of, I automatically when I first started watching that, I knew it was CGI. Now, now we're talking the difference between CGI and robots, but I could almost tell it was CGI just because of the movements and how. Yes. Yes, it, it, I said, "Oh, that's a that's CGI. That is not a robot." And I picked up on that very quickly. And what a lot of people thought it was a real robot uh, running around, and it was a real video, or at least that people were confused by that. But yeah, that's kind of so, off on the tangent. So some of my future research, um, which you can stay tuned for that uh, within the next year, um, is has to do with body language and um, and trust with agents. So. Uh. So let, unless you have something to, to, to add about the conference, I think we've kind of uh, did a kind of good job of talking about the, some cool things about the conference. Uh, so could you, uh, I mean, is there, you kind of led into what you're, what you're working on now. Could you kind of expand on that a little bit for a few minutes? What, what, what's your goals and what you're trying to do with your future research? Sure. Um 
so we, uh, let me first talk about humanoids because humanoids are really cool. Uh, they're my babies. I, I think I have two hanging up right back there. Um, I think I have one of Jamie's hands right here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so what I'm doing right now um, is I'm looking at um, how body language affects trust and trust and a relationship between a human agent and a uh, non-human agent. Um, and we're doing this, uh, we're testing to see how, or our plan is to test to see how um, the robots can portray intention to the human user uh, via body language uh, or other nonverbal means. Uh, so for example, if I, if I look over there, um, that was a big body language. So you might have, if you were here, you might have looked over there too because I just checked, right? It's right. these little cues that might say, hey, there's something interesting over there. Let's do that. Uh, uh, let, let's be interested in that as well. So can we um, a, help the agent tell the human what their intentions are for the future, such as, hey, I'm going to start walking over this way. So how does this, uh, how does the agent portray that? Kind of like with basketball, right? You always follow the belly button, right? Where the belly button is pointing, that is where the person's gonna go. So if you're guarding them, you don't watch their feet, you watch the belly button, uh, because that is the precursor. If that rotates, you're rotating with it. Uh, so, and if we can put that onto a uh, humanoid, or it doesn't have to be a humanoid, another agent, uh, to get this natural body language on the robots that'll help the um, user understand what it's doing naturally, then we're good. I know what my robots are gonna do because I've dealt with them so much. So now I'm used to the little tiny body language that they have. But we wanna put this, these type of agents out with you know, the regular person who's not trained on it and have it be very uh, you know, natural to use. Right, so, so that's that's the humanoid side of stuff that they we're working on at the moment. So, I, I like to use this example because I'm I'm going to be curious to see how this 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 evolves and how this works. So I love using this example with people who do do research in labs and. Uh, so I keep thinking if you put robots in homes in schools, and I know. I know when I was eight, nine, 10, 11 years old, I was always fascinated, not only by uh, the, like the robots or whatever, but I always wanted to take things apart. So I think an interesting thing is going to be seen a as robots get out in the real world because I know what I was like when I was eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years old. I want to see how, uh, I know I'm stereotyping, but young boys like to take things apart. I know as we get older, we still do, but it's gonna, I think it's gonna be fascinating to see how, uh, if we can safeguard robots and protect the robots themselves and how, how young boys are gonna interact with their robots as they get out in the world, because we are, we're always curious to see, not only watching them, but we wanna know how they work. We wanna open them up. We wanna take them apart. Yeah, yeah. It's just gonna be kind of cool. So th there's a there's an amusing meme um, that I like a lot that has it has a, you know, a a father and a mother and a little girl and the little girl asks the father, "Daddy, can I borrow your screwdriver and hammer?" And he says, "Here you go, honey." Then the mother says to the father, saying, "This is not going to end well." And he says, "No." It's not going to start well, but who knows where it will end. And then at the last frame, he's an old man. And then the daughter is now a grown woman. And she walks in saying, I fixed the roof, dad. Thanks, hon. <laughs> so I always love that one. It's uh, yeah. because you take stuff apart and sure, you're gonna break the, you're gonna break the robot, but you're gonna see how it works. Like how many VCRs did you take apart when you were a kid, right? Or, you know, whatever other equipment, radios, that never went back together, but <laughs> eventually something went back together. I, I, I just think that's an interesting uh, talk to have with people because uh, 
I know what I was like when I was eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years old. I mean, I haven't grown out of it. I still like to take things apart, but I was, in that age, I was more destructive. I didn't mean to be, but I definitely, it didn't go back together the way <laughs> I envisioned or the way it worked. Um, so uh, another thing, uh, now we're kind of getting off away from the conference. I'm kind of curious your thoughts. I think we talked about this before we started recording, but uh, there's this really cool idea I've seen because like uh, baseball is about starting to open up and basketball and football. Uh, there's this really cool idea that's been bounced around. I've, I've talked to some people about using UAVs. It doesn't have to be just UAVs, but using robots and UAVs at sporting events and at events is toward telepresence. You have the cameras on them uh, and then that allows the people to sort of maybe interact with the environment at the sporting event, the baseball event, the soccer event, the sporting event. Do you have any kind of thoughts about that? Is that, is that something that is workable or usable? Uh, I mean, it's very doable, right? I don't think uh, quad rotors would be the way to go because A, it's dangerous to the players. B, their flight time is not all that much. But things such as blimps or just fixed cameras, sure. Uh, that's doable, but it all comes down to money, right? Um, what is the cost benefit going to be for whoever puts it on? Um, is it really better to go sit down, uh, sorry, to go view on the screen from your, you know, very poor 500 level seats that you could purchase where you can just turn on TV and get, you know, good, you know, a, a good view? Um, because why do people go to those baseball games? I'm a baseball fan. Uh, why do people go to baseball games in the first place? Well, sure, it's to see the game, but we can do that on TV. It's for the overall experience with the other fans. So without that, I don't think the viewing perspective is the thing that people are for. It's for having, you know, Bob down there, you know, who is a Sox fan, and everyone knows that the Sox are so much worse than the Yankees. Sorry, just look at the number of uh, World Series trophies. Just saying, numbers matter. Um, but Phillies are the best, then the Nats, and then Yankees. Okay, just for the record, so everyone knows. Um, but I don't think it's the visuals that they're looking for. It's that social interaction. So unless they can get that social interaction back in there in an organic way, I don't think it's needed. I don't think that, that cost benefit will be there. It'll be a gimmick, sure, because they already have security cameras. So just face them towards the field and, you know, then people can switch between camera feeds. Or you can have some algorithm uh, make a 3D version of the field and you can be wherever you want to in the field. Why not? But is that really the experience the viewer wants? I think the experience that the viewer wants when they're not at the game is what's being shown on TV. Right. And why do I say that? It's because that's what millions upon millions of dollars has gone into to create what's on TV. Because the more people viewing, the more money they make and businesses react to money. So not what, not what uh, necessarily you want, but what, what you will actually use, right? So it's kind of cost benefits. The, uh, the MVP, the minimum viable product uh, for them. Cool. Uh, so, so let's kind of, since we're kind of talking about this and you seem to be gracious with your time, is your, so I'm just curious, is your school opening up to uh, uh, in-person classes or are you still gonna do online? Are you gonna do online this ah, semester? Okay, so it depends on, I don't know, I have to check my email, you know, since this morning. Um, they might change, who knows? Um, there's nothing concrete yet. They might say they're concrete, but they also said they were concrete a few weeks ago and a few weeks before that and things just changed. Right. Um, my uh, George Mason University classes are all online and my University of Maryland classes are all online. Um, the reason why I'm very strict about this is because I do not trust students. Mm -hmm. um, they are going to be their normal selves and be social. It's what they're gonna do. Um, and by them doing that and interacting with each other, 
that will make them sick if that happens, but I don't want them to hurt me. So to give them the best education possible, I don't want to have to come up with some plan where it's half in school, half out of school, where I'm still going to get sick if any of them are sick, was do a good job online. So um, I believe the university at the moment is trying to go towards a half at school, half um, virtual, but that is going to help zero uh, because you're still having um, uh, you're still having people um, be at school, so it's still going to uh, what they call it uh, interface with each other. Uh, and viruses don't work, um, you know, like oh, 50% of people will get it less if we're there 50% of the time. No, 100% of those people are still there and still passing by the same areas. And unless you have abnormally large walkways and a very strict way of going between classes, it's just, it's just not feasible. The parking lot, for instance, your cars are right next to each other. And so you touch the handle of your car, sure, you leave, the next person comes in um, and you know, their uh, rear hits, as in the rear of their body, hits your door handle, which might not have been sterilized. Now they sit on their car. Now the inside of your car has that. And it just all these things could happen. So there's no reason for us to jump the gun and try to go back when it's, it's blatantly not the right thing to do. Um, the only way I think we should go back is if the guidelines set by the CDC, i.e. the percentages per area is met, the guidelines set by the WHO, the World Health Organization, which would be an international party, are met, and the guidelines from, let's say, Japan are met, i.e. below 20 cases per day. Um, and that would be a third party. So as long as all three of those are met, you know, because that way we're non-biased, sure. But no, right now, none of those are met. So let's not. It, it, it's going to be uh, to be interesting. I definitely would like to have a conversation maybe in a few months as you get into uh, online online classes mm -hmm. on how well that's going and some of the pros and cons you've learned. Because I've talked to a lot of teachers uh, about teaching online, and uh, there's definitely some there's some a few advantages to it, uh, but there's also a lot of uh, uh, not frustration, but pitfalls, because sometimes it's hard to see if a student is struggling or having issues, uh, because if they don't communicate with that to you, some, especially younger kids are more shy and maybe not as outgoing, and they will raise their hand or start talking in online chat and say, oh, I just don't get, I guess I'm, I'm lost. Please help me. Yeah. And so that the individual male and the teacher go up to that kid, help them for a few minutes, get them caught up, is definitely a hurdle. So yeah, it would be cool that, I mean, as we evolve and change and adapt, it'd be interesting to how, what your experiences are. Yeah, you know, that's, I don't, you so, had some limited experience doing that now. Yeah, so, so my plans for next term uh, are gonna be interesting. Um, now I have no relationship to this company besides the fact I plan on using their products for my robotics class is normally I do a, um, robot design class where we use 3D printers and other um, uh, subtraction and additive manufacturing processes to design uh, the robots with all the little parts, um, solder it up as well as manufacture it. Um, but they don't have the facilities if they're at home. So we're making it more, well, because they don't have 3D printers at home. Right. right? They, don't oh. have, they don't have a mill at home. They don't have um, a drill at home. Uh, they don't have a CNC. They don't have a tour. Uh, it, it, they don't have any of it. They don't have a bridge port. So we right. can't do a construction project. And I don't think buying a kit and then putting together a kit is good enough. So instead, um, what we're trying, what I plan on trying to use is uh, Construct Sim, uh, which is, is uh, I believe it's a Spanish-based company that has a really nice. Um, a uh, web interface that is um, that runs virtual robots online, oh, okay. Okay. and it has a nice ROS interface and teaching tools all set up. So I'm trying to get my university to pay for that for the students. 
because that's going to really give them a good um, at home experience with robots so we can still we'll focus more on algorithms instead of the building aspect um but it'll give them a really quality education here um are you talking, are you talking kind of almost vr like no cool? no it's it's just uh, basically think of uh Arviz, um or gazebo rather okay, okay with a um you know nice ross interface but they don't have to install it on their computer so i know that it works um, is that's a big uh, trial just for getting people's computers to work. Even with virtual machines, people might have a slower computer than others, but most of this runs on um, their servers. So, uh, you know, I've tried it a bit and it's uh, worked well so far. Um, so we'll see how that goes. It's a little expensive. Um, it's like $80 a seat um, uh, uh, for four months, but it is what it is. But uh, I'm going to be doing all of my classes synchronously instead of asynchronously. Because I believe, uh, which means I do it at the time and not just pre-record the lecture. Okay. And I believe that this is important because, uh, remember my comment about, uh, thank God for the last minute, otherwise nothing would ever get done. Right. Um, same thing with lectures. They're not going to watch it to the last minute, if at all. Right. But if it's at a specific time, it's part of their schedule and they do it. Plus this way I can take live questions. So though it's not set up now, um, I'm getting myself a nice widescreen TV uh, mounted in my home office, um, installing a, a camera facing that so I can have my slides on the TV. Um, it has me so I can see my uh, body interaction so that it's not just a voice speaking at them. Uh, they can see the body language and pointing to different aspects um, to try and get them engaged more. Uh, not so much for the robot design class, um, but I also teach a circuits for mechanical engineers class. Um, so that I think will be, you know, needed a lot of help. It might need a lot of help for, as well as a software um, uh, for robotics class at UMD. So that I think also the uh, body language will help a lot for as well. Cool. Yeah, I've actually, I've actually talked to a few people who are experimenting with uh, developing uh, VR, like a, like a suit and hands and the, uh, the, the goggles and you have a virtual environment where you can interact with uh, uh, robots and uh, other other 3D objects and that the teacher can be there in the same virtual area and they can watch what you're doing and you can do actually they're trying to work on assembling you like you put a robot together you have a robot kit you got the parts all laid out in front of you and you get your VR uh, goggles in your hands and you put everything together but I don't think it's ready for prime time. Oh, quite. no, that sounds so, to do it well, it sounds very, very complicated to do. Yeah. But the, the, the idea is neat. Um, I, I would doubt that would be appropriately ready for a very long time. Cool. But, but yeah, yeah, the, but yeah, I, as you as a teacher, it's going to be interesting to see how uh, uh, your virtual online classes work. Uh, and the, the, that's an, another really cool topic. I think maybe in the future we can talk about if you're not busy is how your classes are going and some of the pros and cons. Because um, one of the things I've tried, I think big story with, with a couple of robotics companies is doing uh, uh, basically kit building online and like Zoom and other stuff. But then you have all these issues where you've got to uh, get the kits to the individual kids and then, like you said, if they're having trouble during the assembly or the building of the robot, do they raise their hand? Do they stop you? How that interaction, how you can help them if they get stuck. And it, it, it definitely, I, I have noticed that uh, if you have, I'm talking younger kids, mm -hmm. not college age or high, high school, college age, but uh, if they have a, a parent that's mechanically inclined, that's definitely helped because they can step in and help help in their action. But yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see uh, how we do virtual online robotics classes in the future. Now, for all of the um, now for all of the incoming freshmen to universities, um, let me give you a possibility because your university is probably not gonna be normal. Um, I have some students that we work with at NRL and they're high school students going into college, but now they're gonna take a gap year and they're just gonna work you know, with us for the year 
and then go to school, start school the following year. Because freshman year, socially, is your most important year. I am still best friends with the people I made friends with freshman year. That's, that's going to be your biggest thing. So I would recommend that if that you know, it could be a possibility that you just put off school for one year and do something cool in that gap. Uh, I personally don't believe, sorry, education, everybody, but I don't believe that the quality of education for all of your classes are going to be there, um, especially for the prices you're paying, because the best I've heard is that Temple University is not increasing their tuition this year. Other than that, it's everyone's still charging the same amount for this online experience, which in my opinion is not gonna be as good of an experience, even though I'm putting a lot of my own money into doing this well for the students and a lot of extra effort to do it well. But I say just don't, just hold off a year if you want to. Okay, that makes sense. I do, I am, I am worried about the, the this, the kids in high school, uh, junior high, uh, uh, preschool, elementary school, this this gap, this they're they're kind of being set back a little bit, unfortunately. Yeah, uh, so so that that is a problem. It's uh, well, one of my favorite uh, quotes. One of my colleagues, uh, uh, she has uh, two very rambunctious boys, rambunctious boys, and I uh, send her all these parenting memes. And it said, um, uh, uh, we're finding out who my uh, kids has for um, uh, third grade uh, next year. I hope it's not me. Yeah. Uh, the point is that, you know, it's for the younger kids, uh, like let's say probably K through six, um, the parents have to uh, be the ones to really make sure that they're on uh, you know, the computer and, you know, doing those activities with them. Now, my friend, uh, she's a biologist, and so she's been teaching her kids great stuff, finding insects in their house, um, doing chemistry experiments, and doing really cool stuff. She got them some robots. I was very happy about that. But not everyone's as lucky, right? So the, the K through six stuff, or K through seven, the younger kids, something has to be figured out, um, and that might have to do with um, you know, leniency for the parent's job if both of them work. And you can't ask the, the job to give all, take all the brunt of that. So that means the government is going to have to, uh, you know, jump in and, uh, you know, give some money to either the company or to the person if they take part time so that they can monitor their kid. Um, you know, right now things are, it's, it's too much on the parents and it's about to go on to the teachers. Um, yeah. Another great statement that I, I, I read was, if you're discussing if we should open schools and teach in person over Zoom for your safety, the answer is you should not be opening schools. Right. And we're opening in less than a month or a month, the incubation period is between, what was it, uh, four and 28 days for COVID. So no, it, it, you can't. You, you're not even gonna have the data for those dates of, of opening um, because of that long lag. Right. So, right. Yeah. Uh, not gonna be, there's gonna be no good solution. There'll be a solution, it's not gonna be good. Right, yeah, I agree, I agree. So uh, I don't wanna take all of your time, but one of the cool things we uh, during your conference, we were talking about during your lunch break um, about that the cool Gundam robot in Yokohama, Japan. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, by the way. You always post that. Um, so yeah, I have some friends. I have a, actually a friend who lives, uh, I think it's 20 minutes away on the subway. Mm -hmm. So he can he can drop off and go there. It's a, it's near, very near a park. He plays Pokemon in the park, so he can go to the park and see the see the robot. So, so real quick, um, it, that that was designed for uh, the Olympics. That was going to open up for the Olympics, but it's being pushed off. So uh, I sorry, Michael, I can't hear you. Oh, you can't hear me now. 
Did I lose you? Was that me or you? Uh, I'm not muted. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay, sorry. Uh, maybe internet drop. So uh, that robot, that Gundam robot, that uh, that was supposed to open for the Olympics. And it's supposed to be a huge attraction uh, for the Olympics. Uh, yeah. But, but because of COVID and the fact that the uh, Olympics have been pushed off till next year, they're taking they're taking their time. But there's, uh, I, I like you, I've seen this debate online. It's not. It's going to sort of walk. But if you've seen it, there, it's connected. Uh, it's a really strong connection between the center of gravity and the middle of the body to a huge comp, a concrete block. Yep. So uh, it's, telesco it's telescopy. Oh, good to know. OK. So, so what will happen is that, that, that support is like a, tel a telescope, and it will slowly expand out and move the robot in and out of the factory. And it'll be kind of animatronic like. Will it then, walk, or is it, uh, or is it just going to move straight out? Well, what's going to happen is it's going to simulate the walk. So as, as it's being pushed out by the the support, it'll do a walking motion. Very cool. Um, as far as I can tell, it has like 24 degrees of motion, mm -hmm. uh, articulation in the legs and the hips, and it's supposed to be able to uh, do arm movements and they're developing a hand for it too, yep. so it can manipulate. It can move the hand, uh, but I definitely want to go see that. Uh, but I don't know when we're going to have it's going to open and where we're going to have opportunity to travel to Japan, unfortunately. Yeah. So uh, you know, obviously the U.S. we're doing very poorly. Uh, we could be have a lot better um, guidance um, on you know how to do things to make sure that we get our numbers lower. Uh, but recently. Uh, about a month and a half ago, a month ago, um, Japan opened up again because their numbers were really low. Um, Tokyo was even close to 20 per day or below 20. Um, however, about three weeks after um, that happened, two weeks after, they're above 200 a day again, um, cases. So they were doing the right thing and you know they followed guidelines, they even went to a very low number but because it's a very dense city and, you know, just, you know, the interaction, it went back up, uh, which is dangerous. We're going to have to rely on a, probably a vaccine uh, for this, which obviously won't be 100%, but it's... What, well, just a little side topic. Uh, I don't want to get into the big mask, no mask debate. I, 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 if you want to wear a mask, please wear a mask. But... Uh, in Japan, oh, but the, if you're out of the house, you Japan, wear a mask. The, yeah. If you're out of the house, you wear a mask. Because if if you're out there, you put on a mask because you're putting me if you don't, you're putting me in danger. It's easy for you to do that. If you don't put on a mask, I can't leave my house. So you're putting me in jail. So Well, I mean what, what what I was trying to get to it is that in Japan they wear masks. If they think they're sick or if there's a pandemic, they wear masks. The, the worrying thing about Tokyo and Japan is that I know a high percentage, almost everybody out in public right now is wearing a mask. Yep. So, I mean, it's just a little sidebar. It's a little worrisome that, that uh, and, they're, and Japan is a very clean, especially Tokyo, mm -hmm. it's a very clean uh, city. They clean it constantly. They're very hygienic. So it is, it is a little worrisome that, uh, that they're having issues with outbreaks in uh, Tokyo and Japan. Yeah, but uh, let's look at the um, how big that outbreak is, right? Tokyo is one of the largest cities in the world. And they're concerned right now about over 20, uh, 200 cases per day. Um, okay. My area, which is not even close to one of the largest cities in the world, I would guess right now we're well over uh, 200 cases per day. So per population, they're just being more sensitive about it. Um, in the United States, we are per um, 100,000 people or per whatever thousand people you want to do, we're still drastically higher than any, anyone else. So it helps. Right. Uh, so do it. It doesn't hurt you. 
do it. Just like you will put on a seatbelt in your car when you drive, put on a mask. They're stylish now too. You don't have to just wear those. Make a stylish one. I, I wear stylish things. Yeah, that. Yeah, the, the with baseball open next, like today, it's going to actually be a, a game at Royal Stadium. No, no, uh, no attendance. Yeah. But yeah, when you like go to a sporting event, I'd be more than happy to wear like a, a Chiefs, Kansas City Chiefs mask or a Royals mask or Forty KC mask. Yeah, that that but, that's not a problem with me. Yeah. But you won't be able to stay, you know, that six foot, which is not even a, a great distance, should be further than that apart um, at all times. It's just not feasible again, right? Uh, so being put in those situations where you can't uh, do those social distancing rules um, is a problem. Just like with the reopening of schools, a lot of schools are going to have their uh, teachers and their and the students sign a pledge that says, uh, "Hey, we're going to follow all these rules because they're trying to get out of any lawsuit that happens if there's an outbreak." But right here you know that this is not feasible because our walkways are 10 foot wide right our shoulders are two and a half foot wide so even if we're at the vast you know side to side the tips of our shoulders are still five foot violating the social distancing at the absolute best so it's the kinematics of the and dynamics of the school and how most of them are set up. It's just not possible to do social distancing 100% um, of the time, which needs to happen. And if we all just stay home for a month, like literally we stay home and we have volunteers like, uh, you know, or people from the National Guard come in and give us food, um, you know, for that month and they are excessively screened and sterilized, things will go away. But that requires everyone in the world to do this all at once, which is not feasible either. So thus, vaccines, yay. Mm -hmm. that, that, that. Okay, cool. Uh, let me go over my, uh, I think we pretty much covered everything that I was kind of interested in talking to you about. I mean, this has been kind of cool. I like these hangouts where I just talk to people uh, with common interests that I, I have and just kind of shoot the breeze and talk about different things and what's going on. So, I mean, I appreciate your time and everything. Do you have, is there anything that you just, uh, you know, bring something so you want to talk about? I just want to bring up the, uh, so my latest research, um, my latest big thrust, as I mentioned, is in uh, swarming and emergent behavior, uh, which also connects to trust because um, the idea is we wanted to find a high level task uh, for a group of agents to do, um, but all the agents should only have basic uh, rules such as don't get too close to your neighbor, but don't get too far away. Uh, go in about the same direction as your neighbor, and if something's coming at you, move away from it. You know, just like birds. Those are the rules that birds do, and then they make these beautiful flocks that looks like a higher level uh, behavior but it's really a bunch of lower level stuff. So we're trying to do the inverse, right? We define the higher level and determine what those lower level behaviors are. And then how can we determine that, yes, that higher level behavior is gonna happen so that we can trust it. So how can we prove uh, what this emergent behavior is so that we can you know, put it out in the field and actually have uh, them do what we like. So that's, the, uh, that's our latest. Um, this is uh, you know, in the air, on the ground, and underwater. Um, and possibly in space eventually. So cool. multimodal stuff. Our latest research. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah, I'd be curious to, yeah. I did, I, of course, we're friends on Facebook, so uh, definitely post what you can. I mean, I know that you can't post everything because you don't want everybody to know what you're doing to the oh. minute detail, but yeah, definitely. Yeah, we post the cool stuff. Um, and for those who have not seen the uh, workshop, uh, you know, please do go watch it. Um, uh, shortly, we'll have each of the talks individually cut up so you don't have to watch it all straight. Um, they're all very good talks. Um, uh, my personal few favorite were Ishiguro Sensei. So he always gives a wonderful talk. Um, Mark Tilden's was hilarious um, and also very informative about making robot toys and how to not hurt children. And that's an mm -hmm. aspect of trust right there. Um, mm -hmm. But because it focused on the politics of it, 
my favorite was Joshua Kroll's um, uh, from Navy Postgrad because he really talked about um, you know trust and law um, at the same time uh, and, and with autonomous agents, and that is a very interesting topic to me. But oh yeah, I find that fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, but other wonderful um, uh, speakers as well. So please, uh, please do uh, watch those. So. Yeah, cool. Yeah, when I when I post this video on Facebook and YouTube, I'll put the links down to your your, your YouTube video. And then when you break it down, I'll, I'll post those too. Yep. The links yep. those right things. on the website. Yep. Okay. Awesome. Okay, so I think we're gonna gonna end the recording now, uh, and. Uh, Say kind of bye to everybody. Bye, bye everyone. Thank you.